Today we're speaking with uh, Richard Eisenhower, the 2006 College of Education and Human Sciences Distinguished Alumni. Dr. Eisenhower, welcome to the University of Nebraska, the College of Education and the Department of Educational Administration. Happy to be here. That's quite a mouthful. Yes, it, it is. I'm, I'm happy I got all that out. As, uh, as has been said many times to you today, we're very pleased and it's our privilege to have you here. Uh, I've admired your work for a long time, as you well know, and many others here are of that very same notion. So we're, we're happy you were the one that was selected as the 2006 Alumni Award well, winner. Thanks, Larry. I, w I was pleased and, and uh, a bit surprised, and, and, and it's, uh, it's been very gratifying to me, and it's been a good day today. I've enjoyed very much being able to be back on campus. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It's changed kind a little fun. bit, too. It's changed quite a lot. <laughs> Well, today we're going to talk with Dr. Eisenhower about his role as an educator and specifically his work as a superintendent and his work with diverse student populations. First, Dick, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you happened to choose education as a career. Well, you know, there are people that talk about going into profession because they, they were inspired by someone or modeled, and the truth of the matter is that I was kind of floundering around and didn't know where I was going to go and, and ended up uh, in the teacher's college. And I'm sorry, I just have to confess that. That's the way it happened. It, but uh, went out and, and, and started to teach, and that soon changed into, a, I think, a, a change in me and a recognition that this was the right place for me and that, that this was the area that I wanted to, to spend my life. And, and I saw a, an opportunity to... to be on a mission, so to speak, and to, and to have some positive impact. So once that decision was made and started in, uh, my career moved along. I actually only ended up teaching for three years, and so the bulk of my 43 years have been 40 years in school administration, uh, principal and then assistant principal or assistant superintendent, I should say, and then uh, the last uh, 27 is superintendent of schools in uh, various venues in, in Nebraska and in, in other states. So it's been, uh, it's been a career of different experiences. It's, uh, it's been one where I've grown a good deal, I think. And, and throughout that time, uh, a sense, a growing sense and appreciation of, of the mission and the challenges, but yet the potential of public education and how critically important I believe that is in, in terms of uh, a democracy, obviously, but the, but the future of, of the United States and its its place in the world. Depends a lot on education. Well, it, it really all comes down to education, I think, and, that, uh, and I take a good deal of pride in, in what this country has done, but I take a, a view a good deal of challenge, I think, in where we need to go if we're going to continue to, to move beyond and where we've been and, and to, to take those next steps. Uh, to, to really develop the potential, and, and particularly, as you know, my interest in, in making sure that no child left behind, for instance, really means that, that we recognize the, the future that's required and that, that we can't afford any throwaway kids and that we need to indeed uh, really embrace those concepts that we'd like to talk about, about all kids can learn. We need to really believe yes. that. We need to develop the systems that assure that because they are indeed our future. During those 43 years uh, in education, did you ever think about any other kind of a career? Oh, I, I suspect that, well, I know that there have been several times that I, like I think you probably and everybody else that goes into education, think that, well, there are other things that I could do. And there were from time to times when I thought about that. Would there be other things that I might want to do? And it always came back to the same answer. I thought, no, I think this is what I want to be. And, and as I talk to people sometimes as I reach that point near retirement of people saying, you know, would you, would you do anything different? Would you do, you know, well, maybe, uh, but uh, not really. As this is, this is important work. Very and, much so. And uh, this is important to, to uh, you know, an important uh, a place where you can make a difference and you can make a contribution. And, uh, and I, I guess all in all, I've oftentimes said that being a superintendent of school has to be just about the best job anybody can have. Um, it's uh, it's always interesting. <laughs> you never know quite it what's going to happen. Uh, you find yourself in situations that you never thought you would, but you're there for the right cause, and and you do have then the position of opportunity to 
to help to carry through some of the things that that need to be done I think so it's uh, it's been a, an interesting and a rewarding experience and career for me and, and I wouldn't do anything else I wish I would have been smarter earlier <laughs> you know <laughs> don't uh, we all uh, wish you would have known some things uh, you look back at some things and you say that was a good thing you look back on some other things and you just shake your head and say I wish I would have been able to seize that opportunity to, to do more but I guess that's probably the way it is with everybody. I think it is. Well, with 27 years in the superintendency, was there ever a typical day for you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, again, as I said, superintendency is a, is a, it really is a good job and an interesting job and a challenging job. But it's one that I find more and more is one that's a real challenge for balance and, and keep and focus on, on what's really important because, uh, I don't, I don't want to sound negative at all about any colleagues, but you know, it's, it's a management job, but it's not a management job. And if, you, if that becomes the consuming thing to run a district or something like that, that all needs to be done. But I recall doing a survey, and, and I find this becoming more and more of a conversation nowadays that superintendents are having and, with each other as professional colleagues about how much time you really can spend and how you find the time or where you put the emphasis on improvement of education, uh, leading for, uh, you know, doing, uh, being a leader for learning yes, as opposed to a manager. <clears throat> and how do you keep that balance between taking care of the stuff and, and attending to the mission? And, uh, and that really is a challenge. Uh, I know in my own career, I, and I don't suspect that uh, there's anybody that's been through the superintendency that hasn't heard this, you know, like the, you ought to spend more time in school, for example. And that's important. We know that. But you can get so bound up with the other stuff that you need to do that takes some time. And then the other demands of the job that are all, also important, you know, the, the community involvement. Um, on the one hand, that's important, I think, to be a good citizen. And pragmatically, you recognize that being involved with the community opens up venues for opportunities to engage and involve and hopefully gain the support of the broader community but it also takes time away sure, and yeah. so uh, to really keep a focus on how you can use the position to indeed improve education I think is is the biggest challenge so typical day is a lot of it trying to find the time to do that it's not uncommon I think to find superintendents who are putting in 60 70 hour weeks because of that because they're trying to to find the time outside of the other demands to stop and think or study or <laughs> read or or seek some balance as you said earlier really. yeah. yeah well i know you were very involved in communities and uh, i think you were even mayor of one of the communities <laughs> where you lived <laughs> a long time ago yeah, yes. a long time ago um, you you've talked a little bit about this but could you talk a little bit more about what was your motivation for community involvement y you were it seems to me more motivated than a lot of people mm -hmm. to really get in the community and work for the community as well as the school and how did they blend? Well, as I say, you know, they, they were from a couple of fronts. Number one, by the nature of the job, superintendents tend to turn over in communities too often, in my belief. I think that's, that's one of the issues for the future. Um, secondly, because of that, you know, you could be kind of viewed as a, a carpetbagger. You know, mm -hmm. somebody who comes in from the outside, uh, takes our money for a while, really isn't part of us, really isn't part of the community, um, and leaves. Um, I think that's unfortunate because you need to become, as I said, you, you, part of it's being a good citizen, but part of it is, uh, very practically, this is the way if you're, you've got to become part of a community because the public schools are the community schools. Mm -hmm. They don't belong to the superintendent, they don't belong to the school board, they don't belong to the teachers, they belong to the community. And so the value that of, of them to the community demands, I think, a chance to reach out, engage, and involve, and challenge sometimes the community to be part of that. So how do you do that? Well, I suggest to new superintendents that part of the way that I've discovered that I think has worked pretty well is to look for those venues or opportunities where 
<laughs> they may be surprised that somebody steps forward and said, yes, I'll help with that, and we're glad to have you, usually. Mm -hmm. but, but realistically, it connects you with people because you could get locked into and spend all of your time dealing with the stuff within the system True. and be completely isolated if you let that happen. And, uh, and I think the, the bigger picture kind of demands that more community involvement plus uh, doing your best then to contribute back to the community that's supporting you and supporting your schools and most importantly supporting the kids. Yep, good thoughts. I agree. And I know you were big in United Way and that's, uh, that's one way to really touch a lot of different parts of a mm -hmm. community. What were some of the other organizations that uh, were important to you? Oh, I've been, you know, like I say, been a United Way volunteer, been involved with scouting for all my, all my life basically in, in various capacities. Uh, I spent a good deal of time working in chambers of commerce, economic development circles within communities. Again, for those same reasons, sure. a healthy community requires you know all of those things to work together, and the schools ought to be a logical part of that. I think in in helping to shape and engaging in dialogue with people about uh, what the needs are, what they can do, what you can do, where you can seek partnerships to get things done, and so those have been some of the things that I've done. You well, mentioned I've dabbled, of course, with a few legislative issues from now and yeah, time to time. Now and again, <laughs> you've uh, you've been in several states. Yes, three or four. Um, were there some advantages to being uh, seeing education in three or four different states, and were there some disadvantages to that? Well, I think that I've grown personally because of that. Um, the advantage I, I get, you know, there. There are not a lot of basic differences that I've discovered between educational issues that exist one place. You know, each, each area might have its own idiosyncrasies and laws and procedures and so on. And I mentioned uh, in the hallway going to Oregon and nobody loving democracy like Oregonians <laughs> uh, to vote on everything in the world, it seemed like. Uh, but the fact the 10 years that I spent there where we had 22 or three elections <laughs> for various things, including whether we'd have the money to run schools, does create an understanding about the importance of dialogue with community about what the mission of the schools oh, yes. is and what you're delivering. So I think you grow from some of that. Uh, it's afforded me opportunities to to get a greater appreciation, I suspect, for diversity and issues of diversity than I might have had had I been in one place uh, uh, or, or even in one state. Uh, so I have a I think a, an appreciation and a, and a fairly good understanding of the changes that are taking place in America with the changing face of Nebraska and, and, oh. and America that's obvious and uh, and how we might deal with that. Um, I don't know that there have been disadvantages. Well, it's not in part of my nature. You know, I've looked at this retirement thing with some reluctancy um, because I, I get excited. I said earlier in the day, I wish I was 40 again because there's so much to do. <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, so I missed out on the opportunities if I would have been looking for that, you know, to have an early retirement, but uh, that wasn't something I that wanted wasn't to do part anyway. Of it. So I, in fact, I guess the short answer is no, I don't see a disadvantage of that. I think to me it's been an advantage to learn from different environments, different settings, different political environments, but yet to understand the, the, the critical nature and core nature of the importance of public education in all of those, and particularly with the with the, the traditionally disenfranchised in mm -hmm. our society. Good answer. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but uh, as you look forward, what, what kind of challenges do you foresee for public education? And then in particular, for, for those people who are preparing to be school administrators in the future? Well, it's obviously the complexity is growing as the world gains, gets more complex. So the expectations for schools are not getting narrower, they're growing, I think, exponentially. Yep. Um, that that we're, we're learning that, what, uh, that the future, that uh, some of the things that I've tried to describe today, Larry, that aren't gonna happen if we just sit in our own world. The, the time for your box and somebody else's box and somebody else's box, uh, it's just not gonna happen anymore. Success is gonna happen by reaching out, engaging, challenging, championing, uh, all of those things that, that I think are gonna have to happen. And so it's gonna, it's gonna get much more complex than it's been before. Uh, it's more political than it was before. Uh, then uh, you need to be sensitive to those kinds of things. So 
there needs to be some savvy on the part about how things work and how to make things change. Uh, there needs to be flexibility. Uh, I'm a little aside, I'm, I'm working on a, a project that uh, I'm trying to put together kind of a superintendent's academy sort of thing to particularly for people that are coming into the profession and I entitled it uh, uh, dealing with ambiguity boxing water or herding cats <laughs> or something like that or is it the best job in the world and trying to bring those together because certainly you do need to deal with ambiguity um, so anyway that's that's kind of a rambling long answer but uh, the challenges I really do see schooling at being at an important crossroads right now in that uh, with the demands that are changing from a variety of reasons for us being expected to guarantee to respond to so many forces, political, realistic, some of them realistic, some of them not, but to be able to respond to those, we're going to really have to, to use the t now time-honored term, break the paradigms that mm -hmm. we've lived in. And we're going to have to find, I believe, and respond to what seemed to me, and I hope this didn't sound smug or, or self-serving, and I know it's dear to your heart, is a, what appeared to be a diminishing number and quality of leaders for this profession. And we have to find a way to identify that. I know those people are there. They are. But we have to find a way to bring them in and to develop them and nurture them and challenge them to take education to the next step because we're really at that point where I think there's going to be demand for great change in the way we structure and organize and, and present educational programs because they haven't changed very much, quite frankly, during years of my career. Not in our lifetime. And if that doesn't happen, then I think education will be passed by and people, will, the customers will go somewhere else where they can get it. And I, and I really see that as a challenge. I think the next decade, decade and a half are going to see things remarkably different. You know, it's interesting, Dick, because in this end of the business, we're seeing more competition than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, people have discovered there's a way to make a dollar in selling high quality education. So the competition is on at the higher ed level. And I think you're right on target when you're thinking about the competition is going to be on at the K-12 level as well. Yeah. And then you add that with some of the current political environment, you see some underlying sources that oh, seem yes. to be going in that direction. Uh, some of them misguided in my judgment, but yet it's real and it's there. And, uh, and we educators need to not just accept it all blindly, we need to challenge it and point out what we're doing well and we need to continue to do that, but we also don't need to be afraid of it. And, uh, and we're going to have to get better at being responsive to the changing marketplace, if that's the term to use or history tells you it will pass you by. I think your comment about not being afraid of it is really a, a good comment. And uh, being able to work with change, the challenges mm -hmm. that come from change. But let's talk a little bit about change. If you could change three things about the current state of education, uh, what would they be and why? And this is kind of moving yeah. it forward. The biggest deficiency that we all deal with is time. Uh, in several regards, you know, the, with, the, with the changes that we're dealing with, the complications of, of education, the needs of the development of the workforce of the future, and all those things, the things that we talk about, we need to have time and flexibility to be able to respond to a focus on learning, and we need to move away from the structure that we put together for schools and education, and uh, so, to be able to to really develop that seamless educational stranded and cycling process from early childhood through con lifelong continuing education and get away from the, the traditional look like, well, if I'm put in my eight semesters of high school and graduate, mm -hmm. now that's over. Whew, I made it. <laughs> or if I put in my four or five years of college and pass the test and get through this class and make it through statistics or whatever it was for you <laughs> it was it was statistics <laughs> that then you know now i'm done with it you're never done with it and so we need to rethink the way we do that i said several times today and i'll say it again that uh, we need to think about school as a verb not a noun we need to seek partnerships we need to break down 
traditional uh, uh, structures that we have. We need more regionalization. We need more cooperation. We need, we need to engage industry and business in what they can offer and what we can offer and how we bring those together and talk to, with each other instead of about each other. And uh, those are the kinds of challenges I think that are going to take place. This whole world of technology, it's hard to fathom what potential that might have. And, and you know the real promise of that seems to me with students? For the first time there may be enough of a variety of access of information and so on to really shift the responsibility of learning to the student. To them. And have a way to deal with that. Because kids can grasp and grab and, and then we can really, you know, to use the cliche, really be the guide rather mm -hmm. than the, the dispenser of everything you ever needed to know. And that's, that's a real promise, but that again, we have to accept the challenge of that and not be afraid of it. You know, a friend of mine at Penn State said, uh, he's podcast his courses now for two years because stu students won't come to class. They would rather be doing other things. They like his material, uh, but he has a lab once a week and he does podcasts the rest of the time. In the lab, they practice what he preaches mm -hmm. and what they preach and they can do other things. So he's using the technology wisely as a tool, not as a savior. I'm being an old-fashioned guy. I've wondered about it. I talked with, with a colleague of mine who's been a student now in online classes through several classes, and I asked her about that. I said, how is it? And I've also talked to some professors about that. Well, the student says, I'm working harder than I ever did in any yes. other class. And she said, part of the reason is I can be in a class, and if I want to, I can kind of hide within the class, yep. I don't or no, respond or not respond. She says, online, I have to respond to every single thing. And so I'm true. working harder and more engaged, really, than I would be. Now she sort of misses the personal interaction part of it. But I thought, I thought that was pretty interesting. And the professor I asked about it said pretty much the same thing. He has he, to stay on top almost all the time of any time things might come in and out and how do I respond to that? And it's it's true. I, my Wednesday night class goes home at 10 o'clock, but my online class never goes never away. Never goes home. <laughs> <laughs> they're never home or they're always home and calling. Um, as you look back over your career and you've had a very successful career, what, what would you um, put forward as your greatest rewards? Hmm. I think a uh, you know, couple of uh, one of the things that I that I feel good about, and like I said, there are a lot of things I wish I'd been smarter and known more about it and been able to do more at the time. But there have been two or three times in my career when uh, believing as strongly as I do in the importance of early childhood education, where I've been had an opportunity to move some things forward. A long time ago in Nebraska at Norris School District, south of Lincoln, mm -hmm. we started at that time, I think, Nebraska's only and publicly funded preschool program that was open for anybody who wanted to come, and people did. Um, when I, in Oregon, uh, for instance, when we did have elections on everything, and I remember the time when the, uh, the school district did not have kindergarten. Hmm. And for somebody like me, that was a travesty, and, I, and so, about the second or third year, I convinced the board that as we went for this election to see whether we would have money to even run the school, that we also would include kindergarten. And, uh, and the challenge was, you, you can put that forward, Mr. Superintendent, if you think it's important, but it has to be a separate ballot from the operational levy because we don't want that to drag us down. <laughs> and to my delight, today, you can tell by my smile, <laughs> The kindergarten issue carried the regular issue. It was the only time we ever passed that operating level, hmm. the first time out. And uh, so I <laughs> felt pretty good about that. Uh, and, then, and then in Lexington, uh, my last and most recent, it's coming back to Nebraska, the work collaboratively we were able to do with Tyson Fresh Meats, with the school, with some other grants and funds and agencies, and putting together a meaningful uh, early learning academy for kids that are starting out this educational race two or three laps behind, not to their fault, not to their parents' fault, by their, by their background and experience and seeing what's developing there with that. Um, so that part of it's been, been pretty rewarding. Um, I think beginning to address some of the alternative kinds of programs for 
some of the kids that I always say in the kind of sense, the misfits, that don't mm -hmm. quite fit our mold of what a high school or a middle school student ought to look like, and beginning to, to respond to some of those. Uh, need to, that's a journey that's got a long ways to go. And I guess then the other part of that I feel really good about is that there have been a couple, a few people I think that maybe I've influenced positively about this profession and their career and saying, you know, I believe in you and you need to go on and you need to do some things and you ought to connect with the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not that the doctor is going to make you smarter, but it's going to also open the door yeah. for you to, to make an impact that you might not have otherwise. So I, I feel, and that's the part of it that I'm, I hope to continue to do, uh, particularly working toward uh, what I can do from the outside and from consulting or working with people and, or helping with people in placement of jobs to, uh, to try to match the, the leaders because I'm really concerned about that, concerned about the shortage, concerned about the quality, but I'm concerned about the kind of environment that exists that there's, there's got to be a reason that we have such frequent turnover of superintendents. Mm -hmm. and that needs, if we're going to really make systemic change, I think the research indicates we've got the longevity as a major factor. Not just doing same old, same old. But, uh, so I hope that work that we can do in the universities and some of us in the private sector and others can do to, to do a better job of development of operating principles and what success would be and, how to engage superintendents and boards and communities together about what the key issues should be rather than hit and miss and here and there right. is a real challenge. That's something that, that uh, I'm not sure I know how to do yet, but I think that's something that we need to all work on. Yeah, I think so too. When we were concerned a couple of years ago, actually about six or eight years ago, because we didn't have very many people interested in the superintendency, but that started to come back. And uh, now we're finding men and women both interested in really looking at those district level jobs. So that's, that's a good sign. And there are going to be some opportunities there. Absolutely. But, but the, the challenge is going to be there too. And, you know, the, what is the, what, the national tenure? Still only two and a half, three years or something like that. Isn't in it? urban schools, it's very short. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I think uh, we always talk about if you can be in a district at least 10 years, you're going to make a positive difference there if, yeah. if you're the kind of person you're talking about. Uh, but if you're moving from place to place frequently, it's much, much tougher yeah. to do. So there's something to be addressed there that if the promise of public education and the change is going to take place, there has to be, and our leaders need to learn or develop the skills of, of collaboration, of communication, of involvement, and again, not be afraid of that. And uh, some of us old timers, that's been a that's been a hard lesson to learn, you know, because I'll speak only for myself. But if when you didn't know how to do something, you weren't sure you ought to acknowledge it, you know, maybe that's a sign of weakness or inability. And okay, what, what if they want somebody else then, <laughs> you know, to do that sort of thing? And then coupled with the fact that we always thought we were supposed to be able to fix it, mm -hmm. you know, I should have been smarter. I should have been able to do this better. I should have been able to solve that. I should have anticipated that. And now it's uh, the really leaders, the transformational leaders, if that's what it's called, need to, to develop those skills of gaining power through empowerment. You know, that's a real thing. That's not it just really a concept. Is. Because there's, I always tell colleagues, there's more work than any of us can do. Yeah, don't worry about getting it all done yeah, yourself. There's more than we can do. So the only way we can even come close to getting it done and grabbing it is if we embrace it together. And I say, I'm good at this, you're good at that. I can handle this piece of it, you take that part of it. And by the way, those part of it, rather than us complaining in schools about, well, that's not our job, then all right, whose job is it and how do we engage them to make sure it's happening because they're probably dealing with some of the same issues. Yeah, I think they it are. It is a different kind of leadership, I think, that we're seeing. than. Than, than, than the traditional view of the man in charge generally was a man. Yes, generally was. Now we're bringing in more women, and it's a good thing because women are smart. <laughs> well, and they, they certainly have a different way yeah, of yeah. Uh, and that's good. engaging bringing that people. Plan together yep. is good. It's excellent. Well, I think we're about at the end of our time, and um, I'd like to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add, some things that we may not have covered that you'd like to talk about. Well, I don't know who's going to watch this. 
probably my mom. Would if we did. No. <laughs> yes. But uh, that's what I said about. My I'm going to watch it. That's what I said about my dissertation. <laughs> I wonder if anybody ever read. The, you know, um, your no, committee. Anyway, uh, I guess if if this were to be seen by somebody who was thinking about, you know, is this the direction for me? Is this the profession for me? Um, I would tell you just straightforward that I think that there are few choices that you can make that have more of a potential for for good, for doing the things that I think are so critically important and need to be done for for the future of this state and this country and our place in this shrinking world than accepting the challenge of the of leadership and, and moving. And it doesn't mean everybody should be a superintendent. But wherever your place is in that, you know, grab it. Uh, a student asked uh, today about, well, how do you keep yourself motivated or encouraged when, you know, in spite of challenges or the, you know, the stuff that happens to all of us? Well, the stuff is always going to happen to you. Depends on what you focus on. And if you have the mission in your heart, mm -hmm. and I think that's critical, it's got to be in your heart. Then you will. Then you'll keep going and say, "Okay, I can. I can do this. I can make it through this." You know, because I know what's out there, and and then you have your focus in the right direction. And so I just hope that there'll be people that will pick up that banner and and say, you know, there's nothing more important I think to to our future than quality public education. Recognizing the faults and saying I'm committed to doing my part at least to try the best I can to commit it, then, then we'll be all right. Well, and I'm glad to hear that uh, even though you may have retired from one part of the profession, you're rewiring to work uh, still in that profession, helping other people gain ground, uh, look for opportunities in education, and I, we need people like you doing that. I'm going to try my best. Good. Dick Eisenhower, congratulations. Good. I, I think you. our selection committee did an absolutely outstanding job this year, and we're very pleased and proud to have you here. Well, I'm humbled by it, but I'm also very gratified, and it's uh, there is no place like Nebraska. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>